Welcome to the February 2023 meeting of the Wild Ones Middle Tennessee Chapter. My name is Richard Hitt and I'm the current president. Tonight we are delighted to have our assistant state naturalist, Holly Taylor, as our featured presenter. Okay, so tonight I'll be introducing Holly Taylor. Um, Holly entered the state park system around 2006, working as a naturalist and interpretive ranger. In 2009, she graduated from Tennessee Tech University with a degree in conservation biology. She continued working in the state system and in 2018, she was appointed as the assistant state naturalist. Uh, that puts Holly in some really great company. The original state naturalist, I believe, was Mac Pritchard, who really, I can't describe the good that he did for the state of Tennessee. Um, then there's Randy Hedgepath, which we all probably know because if, if we've been on many uh, state park hikes, he's, he's probably been around. So congratulations on that, Holly. Uh, she's also the chapter coordinator for the Cumberland Mountain State Park chapter of the Tennessee Naturalist Program. Uh, Holly's been very active in some YouTube groups like the Tennessee Naturalist 9,000 plus member group and also Rewild Nashville. She's not afraid to associate with Nashville. And uh, she spends a lot of time making very good comments uh, to, to folks who are trying to learn, learn more about what's going on. So we appreciate that. Um, Holly will be speaking at the Trails and Trillium Conference and also at the Tennessee Plant Conservation Alliance Conference coming up in April. I think the Conservation Conference is April, but I'd have to check my calendar, but it's, it's in the future. So without further taking up time, uh, Holly, let us know what you're talking about. All right, you ready for me to share my screen? Yes. Okay, let me share my screen. Let's see, we got this one, yes. All right. There we go. All right, are we seeing it? Yes, it's good. Good. All right, well, thank you for that introduction. Thanks for having me again. It's nice to be back with the Tennessee Wild Ones. I really love wild ones and everything that you guys represent. And so tonight we'll really be diving into native plants and planning for pollinators. And we probably have people from all across the spectrum joining us tonight. So I'm hoping that whether or not, you know, you're brand new to planning native or you're a seasoned veteran, that everyone will get something out of tonight's discussion because this is an extremely important topic. Um, we know that pollinators are extremely, not just important, but they're crucial to um, just really life on the planet. Um, and um, we also know that they're in trouble. So let's go ahead and jump in. If you guys are ready. And can you can you see the bar at the top of my screen that shows Zoom? No, that's that's hidden okay. from our view. Good. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah. So for tonight's discussion, everything really comes back to biodiversity diversity of life, a diversity of species. And when we're talking about this in the context of pollinators, we're talking about a diversity of native flowering plants. And this is the key to the health and stability of any ecosystem. And pollinators, I mean, this is crucial for, the, um, for preserving pollinators is uh, cultivating, preserving, regenerating biodiversity when it comes to our native flowering plants. So we'll definitely be hitting that message home this evening. So this series of maps that I'm gonna be sharing were published in the New York Times last year. And I thought they were interesting to include since we're talking about biodiversity tonight. So this first map shows concentrations of imperiled diversity in the United States. And you can see there's quite a bit of red in Tennessee and it's, it's kind of, I wish I could interact with the map, but we can't, but you can see there's a lot of red concentrated here. This looks like probably the central basin area. Um, so those are the concentrations of imperiled diversity. And the next map shows areas that are permanently protected for biodiversity. And I don't know about you, but I don't see a lot of green on this map. <laughs> and I see a lot less green in Tennessee than I would have expected to see. And you know, some of the largest stretches of protected land are gonna be you know, this national park and we've got a few state parks that are pretty big, but by and large, you know, public lands that are permanently protected um, are very small and very precious. And the majority of land really all across North America is privately owned. 
And so this is where you guys come in. This is where the general public is so important that we raise awareness about planting native plants because this is what we have to do. Even if, you know, in our state parks and natural areas, if we managed all of that acreage perfectly with native flowering plants and it was perfect habitat for pollinators, it's not enough. It's nowhere near enough to reverse the crisis that we're experiencing with pollinators. So it's important to keep that in mind. Okay, so let's rewind a little bit and talk about pollinators. What is a pollinator anyway? So it is an animal that moves pollen from the male anther of a flower to the female stigma of a flower. And I've seen estimates vary for the percentage of plants that require this. I've seen estimates from 70 to 85%, but around 85% of plants require this method, and that's including your native flowering plants and crops as well. And it's also interesting to point out that not all flower visits result in pollination. So we tend to sort of lump every floral visitor under the um, category of pollinator, but just because you know an insect, for instance, is visiting a flower, it doesn't actually mean it's going to pollinate that flower, but just a fun fact. Now, Pollinators uh, are self-seeking, really. And it's, um, we, we tend to want to think about the relationship between pollinators and plants as one of, of a love relationship. You know, they love each other. When the reality is that it's an evolutionary arms race because each individual, the pollinator and the plant, have different goals. The pollinator is trying to gather as many resources as it possibly can, as efficiently as it can, in order to sustain its life and to uh, have its young, whereas the plant is trying to continue its species as well. So you have this evolutionary arms race and this push and pull or tension across time where you know, each one is trying to take better advantage of the other. And the plants are trying to mitigate the release of the resources so that the pollinators aren't you know, taking all the resources away without pollinating them. So as a result, you have these really complex plant pollinator relationships that have arisen. And some of the more interesting ones are the specialist relationships. And we have specialists in both the pollinators and the plants. There are pollinators that uh, only visit very specific plants in certain families or related families or even certain plant genera. And uh, it's especially true of the native bees. There are a lot of bees that are pollen specialists. And um, that just means that they're only going to gather pollen from a very specific set of plants. And when it comes to the plants, there are species that can only be pollinated by very specific pollinators. And one example I threw up here is a uh, lady slipper orchid. And these uh, are a trap mechanism. And a lot of orchids utilize um, uh, trickery in order to uh, invite pollinators in. So this pouch is actually a trap that is meant to attract um, mostly bumblebees. And so the bee flies in there. It takes a strong bee to push its way inside. And once it's in there, it's trapped. And the only way out is past these uh, exits where the pollinia are. And it gets no reward for this. And so it has to be a naive bumblebee to fall for it twice and uh, achieve pollination. So as a result, lady slipper orchids have pretty low pollination rates. And that's just one of many examples. So the point of it is there really, there's no one pollinator that can pollinate all flowers and there's no one flower that can provide for all pollinators. There's so many complex relationships that we're only beginning to understand. And the specialists are the most vulnerable. And then we have our generalists, which you know both fall into that category. There's pollinators that can visit a wide range of flower types and then plants that can be pollinated by a wide variety of species. Why are they important? Well, most of us uh, realize that they're important. Most everyone is at least marginally aware that pollinators are important. And once again, about 85% of plants require pollination. Over 99% are insects. Uh, it's a pretty high percentage. Most pollinators are insects. Um, and just think about how crucial they are to native plant ecosystems and food webs and all of the species that depend on the species, which depend on the plants, that depend on the pollinators. Um, it's just, it's mind boggling. So they're not, they're really not just important. Like I mentioned before, they're crucial. I mean, you know, they're crucial to life. And of course, when it comes to agriculture, 
uh, upwards of $500 billion in annual value, not just honeybees, a lot of uh, native pollinators are very important as well. And, you know, food security, this all comes back to food security, which uh, relates to national security. So these are big issues that affect everybody, no matter who you are. Even if you're the staunchest meat eater on the planet, you know, you're dependent on pollinators. And just, just a fun fact here, what is this crop down in the lower right corner? Somebody want to tell me what that is? No one wants to guess? <laughs> yes, it's uh, cacao. Yeah, cacao, yep. Still born my cacao. Mm -hmm. And uh, cacao is a very important crop to me. <laughs> I love chocolate. And cacao is actually pollinated by flies, tiny little flies pollinate that. So it's safe to say that pollinators are keystone species. And you can broaden that out even more and you know, recognize that plants and insects really form the foundation of the entire ecosystem. Um, you know, that's where everything begins. So everything from the birds to the predators, uh, mammals, everything really kind of depends on plants and insects and birds. I'll bring up birds several times this evening. I love birds, I'm a big bird watcher too. And the fate of birds is very closely tied to the fate of insects. They're both declining and that they're, they're, it's a related decline. All right, we gotta get all the depressing stuff out of the way first, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta realize where we are uh, and pollinators are in trouble, unfortunately. So insects are, uh, they're in decline in a worldwide rate of about 24%. There've been quite a few studies done in the last few years and it's been pretty alarming, the results have. Uh, in the last 75 years, essentially a generation, we've lost half of the insects on the planet. Um, that's huge. And you don't necessarily hear about it that much outside of this article in the New York Times because people don't really like bugs, right? You know, they're ew, they're, they're creepy, they're crawly, they bite, they sting. And, and you know, the reality is they're wildlife and they're, they deserve protection regardless of how we feel about them. And, you know, it's only a very small percentage of them that have any direct negative impact and the rest are either benign or beneficial, but they're all important for the environment. Over 40% of insect pollinator species are currently facing extinction. And then bumblebees have declined by at least 28%. Um, there's at least two bumblebee species that are federally listed. Uh, one, I believe, is functionally extinct already. So um, like any species, habitat loss is going to be the largest limiting factor. And development of land, of course, is the most dramatic form of that. And you, you take a drive around Wilson County or Davidson County and you can see this happening. I mean, habitat is just disappearing before our eyes. And if they have nowhere to live, nowhere to reproduce, then you know, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna die out. But there's other forms of habitat loss we don't always think of in that context. And one of them is actually reforestation. Um, and you know, we, we tend to assume that because in a particular area, trees are growing there. It's what's meant to grow there and that's what's supposed to be there. But in the many cases, we don't take into account the fact that we've interrupted natural cycles of fires, of, uh, fire, seasonal fires, grazing of large mammals. I think the last bison went extinct in Tennessee in the late uh, 1800s. Um, so we've removed those from the environment. And so trees are recolonizing areas that would have been historically open. And we're um, identifying more and more that a lot of Tennessee was open that we, we didn't realize. The way that we conduct agriculture now has a huge impact with new chemicals, uh, clean fence rows. There was a huge shift from the small family farm to agriculture on an, on an industrial scale, and that's had a big impact. Uh, this, is an, this is another form of, on a smaller scale, white-tailed deer actually kind of exacerbate the problem because, uh, you know, I'll mention this several times tonight, but our native animals don't like invasive species and deer don't like the way invasive plants taste. So they typically don't eat them, uh, which does two things. It means that those plants have no predators and they can proliferate more and they're gonna target the, the native plants, their native plants to eat and they're gonna remove those from the environment. So uh, it's kind of a negative feedback loop, but we just don't have any apex predators for, for deer anymore outside of us. And a consistent driver of pollinator health is tied to the floral resources, their availability, their diversity, and timing as well. And you know, it's 
this affects us too because we have a botanical heritage. We have plants that you know our ancestors used, indigenous people as well used in this on in, in our state, and they're disappearing. So uh, this is an organization, the Southeastern Grasslands Institute, that I love. That some of you are probably familiar with. And uh, they recognize and uh, identify and restore native grasslands. And by reading um, like old accounts of the, some of the first settlers in Tennessee and the Southeast and also identifying um, indicator species, you know, Tennessee was, was a mosaic. It was a rich patchwork of habitats. And if you were like me when I was in college, we learned that basically east of the Mississippi River was all forest to the coast. And, there was the fabled squirrel that could leap from tree to tree and never touch the ground. We know now that that's not true. Um, and Tennessee looked more like this, but only about 10% of the, the grasslands are left in the Southeast. And grassland isn't just prairie. There's a lot of different grassland types. Uh, a lot of our remnants now are found in power line right of ways or roadsides, um, where there's just a few last strongholds of these plants. But these, I mention it because these open habitats are the most biodiverse of all of our botanical um, communities. Let's talk about lawns for a minute. And I don't want anyone who loves their lawn to feel attacked, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not attacking lawns. But it is important to, to see them for what they are, because chances are a majority of lawns in North America aren't necessary. But if you're not familiar with the works of Doug Ptolemy, he's wonderful. Um, he uh, is a great speaker and writer, but this is a quote from him. And he believes that if half of American lawns were replaced with native plants, we would create the equivalent of a 20 million acre national park, nine times bigger than Yellowstone or a hundred times bigger than Shenandoah National Park. Uh, he spearheaded a movement called Homegrown National Park. Uh, <coughs> he believes that um, if we replace this much lawn with native plants that we can reverse the pollinator crisis. So let's look at some lawn stats. So believe it or not, turf grass is the single largest irrigated, irrigated crop in the United States at over 40 million acres. And it's not even feeding anybody. <laughs> That's huge. Uh, it really, when you break it down, it's a social construct based entirely on aesthetics. I believe lawns kind of came into fashion after World War II. It was kind of a, a status symbol in a way. Um, and each year lawns use nearly 3 trillion gallons of water which is a huge concern, obviously, in some areas with water shortages. 200 million gallons of gasoline and over 70 million pounds of pesticides. And there's the source for those, for those stats right there. Um, so obviously, we need some space in our yards to, to uh, just to, to play outside or whatever. But um, just driving around, it's kind of easy to see that, OK, th those acres and acres of mowed grass probably aren't really necessary. So it's just, it's just something that's good to consider. Pesticides are another large limiting factor, and uh, pesticides include insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, etc. All of them do impact pollinators on some level, but none more than insecticides, of course, because they're targeted. And out of them, the systemics and especially the neonicotinoids um, are the most detrimental because they're so effective, and they're very widely used. They're world, uh, they're available worldwide. They're really effective because the plant takes them up and the plant is essentially toxic to whatever eats it at, after that point, at least for, for a, a period of time. And this also ends up in the pollen and the nectar. So if, um, you know, if pollinator is visiting a neonic treated plant and it takes that pollen and nectar back to its young, then they're poisoned. So, um, and of course they persist, it can persist in soil and water. Um, and it's not just agriculture that's responsible for this. Uh, you can go to Lowe's right now if you wanted to and pick up some neonics. Um, and not everyone follows labels either. So um, that is another limiting factor. And there's kind of a loophole in modern agriculture with neonic coated seed. But over tens of millions of acres of neonic planted seed uh, are, are planted annually in the US and Canada. So it's, it's a pretty big issue. Um, fungicides also have an impact. We've actually found that uh, it can make uh, pollen toxic as well. So everything I mentioned before, the lack of floral resources and exposure to pesticides weaken pollinators and make them more vulnerable to pests and, and disease. There's new pests and disease, climate change or extremes and weather patterns. We've definitely had some weather extremes this year. 
uh, that impacts bloom time and uh, can encourage them to emerge too early. Most pollinators have a window of about two weeks or insect pollinators have about a window of two weeks before they starve if they don't have anything available to them. So that can have an impact. And competition from non-native species. And one of the biggest competitors, especially for native bees is the honeybee. Uh, we're, the more this is studied, the more we realize that um, they're a pretty big limiting factor for our, our native wild bees. Uh, just in the amount of resources they consume and take away from the environment, um, they can outcompete and drive native pollinators away. And they're also a vector for disease. We have a lot of uh, pathogen spillover. Um, another issue with honeybees, um, because they're from Europe and Asia, they tend to prefer the plants that are from those areas. And they can actually help uh, increase seed set for some invasive species. And meanwhile, a lot of our native species aren't getting pollinated because there's a lot of our natives that they don't like to pollinate or can't. So they're, they're, it's kind of an issue. Captive raised bumblebees are a big limiting factor for our wild bumblebees. Uh, there's a lot of disease transference from uh, uh, captive raised bumblebees. And uh, I apologize for the crudeness of this screen cap, but they, I couldn't find the original um, graphic. But this is from a uh, webinar that was published by the Xerces Society. And they have a great YouTube channel, by the way, with a lot of free webinars. And this one was about uh, honeybees. And this graphic shows uh, they in this study that they concluded that one honeybee hive actually uses enough resources to sustain 100,000 native bees. So they do use a lot of resources, and, and I don't want you to feel bad if, if you're a beekeeper. I mean, um, you know, don't don't feel bad about this. Obviously, you um, it's a really cool hobby. We need honey, and obviously, we do need honeybees to an extent in agriculture as well. But it's just important to recognize that honeybees aren't a part of the conservation solution because they're not native. So. All right, let's get to the good stuff now, how you can make a difference. The good news is that you can make a difference no matter where you live and on any scale, you can have a positive impact because the needs of pollinators for the most part are very modest. They don't have to have hundreds and thousands of acres. Uh, they don't even have to have 10 acres. They can have much less than that. And uh, just being able to kind of uh, create more corridors or pathways for them a little bit of habitat here and a little bit of habitat there can be enough to sustain them. And thankfully nature is resilient and it's so rewarding to step outside and you, you start planting natives and, and putting all these best practices into place and you start re seeing the, the results of that. And it's a really great way um, to, a really rewarding way to, to have your children interact with, with nature as well. Okay, this is the, the crux of the issue tonight, native or not. And I know some people get a little annoyed by us being such sticklers for natives because, well, non-native flowering plants can provide floral resources. They can provide some nectar and pollen. So there can't be all that bad, right? Um, things like zinnias, cosmos, four clocks, et cetera. These can provide for pollinators. And if you like these kinds of plants, there's nothing wrong with that because they do provide something. And even annuals like zinnias can be a good uh, filler if you're waiting for other natives to get established or you know, if you're just not ready to plant yet. Um, but uh, you do need to be aware of invasive species. Um, butterfly bush has been pretty well established as an invasive, even the um, so-called sterile hybrids do escape. And you know, it does provide, you know, butterflies love it, but it does escape to the wild and can become a problem. Uh, ground ivy, which don't get me started on ground ivy. We have it on our farm. I hate it with a passion. Um, Wisteria, Mahonia, Nandina, all of these can provide some resources, but natives provide so much more. And here's why. So these are the species that are our native species, our pollinators and wildlife, they evolve together. And the thing is, plants don't want to be eaten. So they're essentially prey, if you think about it, in, in the ecosystem. And so they've come up with these different strategies to try to make their foliage and other parts unpalatable. And it takes time, evolutionarily speaking, to overcome those plant defenses. And like I talked about with the pollinators and flowers, you have an arms race. And you know the plants are coming up with new strategies and their, their insects are, and other species are coming up with other strategies to overcome those. And it takes a lot of time to get to that point. And so this is why natives are so much more productive is because they have a lot of things eating them. 
And a lot of things eat the things that eat them. And uh, you can go, if you go to a patch of like a native wildflower versus a non-native, you're just going to see so many more bugs. And we just have to kind of train our thinking to, to like bugs because bugs, insects are so important, especially to birds. I mean, goodness, the our migrating birds are in really are in steep decline right now. Our migrating songbirds and they've got to have insects in order to sustain their migration and also to reproduce, to feed their young. So um, this is why natives are so important. And you have a lot of specialized relationships that I've already mentioned between pollinators and other species. There's a lot of host plants for various butterfly and moth caterpillars and other insects. So, um, and a lot of these things we're just barely scratching the surface on, but they're so important. Uh, some other good talking points for natives is that they are going to be adapted to your local climate. They're going to be adapted to your soils. They tend to have deeper root systems and be more drought resistant. And they tend to be more resistant to pests and disease, provided they're not stressed. Um, and here's another point that can get a little contentious sometimes among people is what we call native ours or cultivars of natives. And um, so that, here's the thing about, about the native ours is whenever we're making changes to a cultivar or to a, to a native plant is to suit our aesthetics generally speaking. Now, there's some cases where you're just, you know, shrinking it down a little bit like a dwarf variety, but a lot of times we're changing the color or shape of the flower. And it's, you know, we're making changes that, um, you know, nature has selected for a purpose for our, our natives to, to look and be the way that they are. And, you know, we're changing something based on our aesthetics. And in the meantime, we're changing things that we may not even be able to detect because, Pollinators see the world very differently than we do, and they see flowers very differently than we do. And um, oftentimes it changes the resources. It can change the nectar and pollen amounts or availability. It might even change the nutritional components. We don't really know. We're only just kind of looking at this. So it's, it's a safer bet to just go with the straight species, the, the one that nature has created, the one that our, our, um, our pollinators uh, are used to. And just to, to throw in an anecdote, um, I got a native bar a while back of Eastern Nine Bark, and I thought Eastern Nine Bark was supposed to be just you know, a powerhouse for pollinators and all these other species. And Diablo is a cultivar that has dark purple foliage. And it was really attractive. I mean, it looked really great in the yard. It had these really pretty pinky white flowers. But I watched it year after year, and there was just nothing happening on it. There was like the occasional fly. There was one butterfly, I think, ever on record. And I was like, man, this is crap. I thought this was supposed to be like an amazing plant. But then I realized or I learned after the fact that that dark foliage that they've done studies, it repels insects, it repels beneficial insects. And so that's just one example, um, you know, things that we probably, we wouldn't even consider. But um, like I said, you know, natives are the way they are for a reason. So, and take it a step further, you, it's good to look for, locally appropriate species. So even within Tennessee, we have a lot of different habitat types. So it's good to know what physiographic province you're in because something that grows really well on the coastal plain in West Tennessee may not grow well up on Roan Mountain and, and so on. And whenever you can look for local genetics, this can be a little more difficult. Um, you know, this, this doesn't mean that we want you to go to your local state park and dig something up or collect seed necessarily, uh, but try to strive for local genetics if you can. Okay, so getting started can be a little overwhelming. Uh, and if you're like me, you know, you get so excited, you just wanna do it all. Um, so first I'll tell you where not to start. <laughs> I would avoid using the big box stores. Um, and by that, I mean places like Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart. And I mentioned them because they are starting to carry native plants just because that's what more people want or if they're wanting native plants. However, um, a lot of times they're pre-treated with neonicotinoids. And even if the corporations say that they don't do that, I have a way of not trusting corporations. So I would say it's just probably a good blanket statement to avoid the big box stores. Seek out local native plant nurseries instead. Um, 
you know, it's it's a it's a lot better from a, a from a lot of standpoints. One, you're also supporting a local business. Now, if you happen to live in Middle or East Tennessee, you're pretty spoiled for choice when it comes to native plant nurseries. If you live in West Tennessee, I'm sorry, <laughs> there is hardly anything out there. Um, if you know of anything, drop it in the chat. But I have not been able to find any any good native plant nurseries in West Tennessee, but there are quite a few uh, mail order. Uh, websites where you can order plants and, and uh, seeds. Also seek out friends who grow natives. Wild Ones is a great community. A lot of native plant enthusiasts who have uh, seeds and seedlings and volunteers and, uh, and of their plants, which they're happy to share. So that's a great way to, to start your garden too. Uh, if you wanna grow from seed, there's a method called winter sowing, which is a very economic, uh, easy way to grow natives. And this is a, a really easy way to achieve cold moist stratification. A lot of our native plants require this. It's sort of a fail safe to keep them from germinating too early. And uh, winter sowing is a great method where you use the, the jugs. There's some great uh, YouTube videos uh, that teach you how to do that. Uh, again, source local if possible. And most importantly, go slow. <laughs> Don't overwhelm yourself. Don't try to do too much too fast. I'm speaking from experience. This picture down here was the first year I decided to do uh, winter sowing and oh boy, I, I went way overboard. I had way more seedlings than I knew what to do with. So I, I scaled it way back this year, but it's hard because you just, you get so excited and you just wanna, wanna plant everything. So go slow. Uh, this is a, a, an easy method to sort of prepare a site. Uh, I think the term for it is lasagna gardening, but basically you just save a bunch of old cardboard and. It's actually better to put mulch on top of this, but um, this is this is an easy way to, um, you know, to, to start a, a site. And oh, invasive plants. So we definitely need to talk about invasive plants because we just wrapped up Invasive Species Awareness Week, and uh, weed wrangle is coming up this weekend. This is a this is a huge a huge battle, and. Um, I will say that technically speaking, it's the lack of natives that's the biggest limiting factor uh, rather than the presence of invasives. However, uh, invasive plants obviously displace habitat. And like I mentioned before, they just don't really have any predators here. And uh, they're just, they can just grow with abandon. And they provide very little in the way of food. Um, they can provide some habitat and some food, but overall, um, not much, not much uh, quality. Um, now, there are some people who are staunchly anti-herbicide or anti-chemical um, of any kind. I don't, I can't say I blame you because I hate chemicals, but herbicides, uh, I feel like it's a, it's a tool in your toolbox that you should not just do away with completely because there are some instances where it's, it's the best solution and, and it's something that we have to utilize a lot in uh, state parks and natural areas. If you're trying to restore a really large area you know, you just can't go out there and dig it all up. There, there's just not, you know, and there's a lot of cases where you don't want to, where you can't disturb the soil. Uh, but thankfully there are more targeted herbicides available now and more targeted, targeted approaches. So, um, but it's just important to, to do your research first. It's ongoing. <laughs> it seems to never end, but don't give up. This picture is kind of hard to make out, but that's a big pile of uh, Japanese honeysuckle. I've been pulling it for years at my house. And I'll just pile it in on my uh, little burn pile and burn it when it's all dried out. And um, you know, it, it never completely goes away. It keeps coming back. But the areas that I've cleared, it's amazing how quickly those native plants just pop up and uh, recolonize. So um, it, it really does take a, a community, though, the, the battle of the invasive plants. So there's a few other practices you can you can try. Um, so one approach is uh, just delay mowing. This is something that you can do now, like literally right now. Um, if you have an area that's gonna be a lawn anyway, if you're like me, you've got a lot of this, this is exactly what it looks like right now. A lot of this uh, dead nettle and hen bit, uh, you'll have violets and buttercups and dandelions, a lot of these species that pop up. And um, in an area, especially where you don't have much in the way of early spring wildflowers, these can be a lifeline. Uh, especially for those early emerging bees, queen bumblebees. Um, it's not ideal. It's not the ideal food source, but it's better than nothing. And they've actually conducted some studies on bee lawns in urban and suburban areas. And if you delay, 
of del delay mowing uh, every two to four weeks or so, uh, it can really help uh, boost the, the pollinators. So it's not something to strive for. You don't want to have like acres and acres of a bee lawn, but if you have a lawn anyway, um, it can be a great way, easy way to provide for pollinators. In some instances, you can just let it grow. Uh, the seed bank is amazing. Chances are though, you're going to have a lot of invasives pop up too. But uh, edge habitat, gosh, is so important. And we have a tendency to want to mow right up to the tree line. And I say we, generally speak, Generally speaking, a lot of people do this, but I see it a lot in state parks as well, uh, where we like to mow the tree line, but that edge habitat is can provide so much food for pollinators. And I've noticed too, like this fall, we allowed a lot more, uh, more of our uh, edges to grow by the woods with more wildflowers and weeds. And it was a hot spot for warblers, especially like these migrating fall warblers were all over it. And uh, we had we allowed some to grow just right next to our windows by our living room. We I'd see like a Cape May or a bay breasted warbler just right there out the window. So edge habitat, very good. Uh, also, if you grow hay or pasture, um, you, there's a lot of ways you can also manage that. That's good for poll pollinators as well. Uh, the Xerces Society has some really good resources for that. Consider keystone species. These are some species I believe that Doug Ptolemy identified. If you have very limited space. If you pick nothing else, native cherry, oak, willow, or native aster, goldenrod, sunflower. And that's just, if, if you have, you know, very limited space, these are good options because they're powerhouses. They feed a lot of species. Really nothing feeds more than an oak in a way, just because so many insects and caterpillars feed on oaks. Uh, so they're especially good for birds, but all of these provide uh, for a number of species. Okay. So I'm going to go through the seasons here and uh, just kind of highlight some ideas for planting. And, um, you know, it's not a comprehensive list by any stretch of the imagination. It's just to give you some inspiration. Early spring is a lean time for pollinators. It's a very, like I mentioned before, it's a very precarious time because these pollinators have to time their emergence very carefully. And if they happen to emerge before their flowers bloom or after their flowers bloom, it can, it can be detrimental. But like I said, they've got about a window of, of two weeks. But these are some early spring, a lot of our early spring ephemerals especially are very important uh, early food sources. Things like spring beauties, which are blooming right now, at least in my neck of the woods, basilias, bluebells, Jacob's ladder, wild geranium, dicentra, which includes more um, Dutchman's britches and squirrel corn, violets, bellworts, and pretty much every species I've mentioned there has at least one native bee that's a specialist on that species. Uh, and there's a lot more than that even. Trees and shrubs, willows, like I mentioned, native willows are excellent early uh, bee food especially, but also service berry and red maple can provide as well. So mid-spring, wild hyacinths, golden alexanders, golden ragwort, phlox. Fleabane is really kind of undervalued in my opinion. Uh, a lot of people consider it a, consider it a really weedy plant uh, it grows all over my property, and let me tell you, pollinators go nuts for it. It is a great pollinator plant, so we just let it grow. Trees and shrubs, uh, there's a lot of great choices in here that um, would do well for even formal plantings because a lot of them are attractive. A lot of these provide can provide food for you in some cases and also birds, and then some of them also have nice uh, fall color as well. So blueberries, native azaleas and rhododendrons, rhododendrons dogwoods, um, bladder nut. And it should go without saying that these are all native. You, know, you want to choose the native choices. American plum, boy, that's a showstopper when they bloom. So there's, a, there's a lot of options in, in the shrubs. Late spring, things like false indigo, spiderwort, beard tongue, wood mint. We talked about wood mint earlier, actually, bophilia, native roses, butterfly weed. Um, now, when it comes to roses, if you like to grow roses, you can grow more traditional types that as long as you can see the, the inner parts of the flower, it's going to be valuable to pollinators. It's just a lot of our, our modern, I guess they call them tea roses. I don't grow roses, but they're just completely closed and you can't see the inner parts. Those don't really provide anything for pollinators. Out of the trees, sumac, virgin's bower, um, Raspberries and blackberries are excellent for a number of reasons. And a lot of these, especially the ones that have pithy or hollow stems, are really good for the stem nesting bees and other pollinators. 
native hydrangeas. We've uh, kind of bred this look out of our hydrangeas. We like the look of the sterile flowers, which are just that, they're sterile, they don't provide anything. Um, so you really want to use the wild type hydrangeas that have the fertile flowers. And it's kind of hard to tell in this photograph, but all those little black dots on there are bees and flies. They just, they love these native hydrangeas. Elderberry is a powerhouse and false indigo bush is another one that's, that's really good. Lots of things, lots of uh, things to choose from in summer is the season of color. Bee balm, St. John's wort, there's so many different types of echinacea. Verbena, milkweeds, rattlesnake master is a really cool one. Prairie clover. One of my favorites though uh, is actually prairie coneflower, Rutibita pinata, which is this one here in the center. And it has a very long bloom period. It's very hardy. Uh, and I've seen so many species on it. Um, there's just, there's literally bees lining up for these flowers. And there's a lot of caterpillars and other species that feed on it. And of course, you've got the seeds uh, for the birds in the fall too. Blazing star, we have native honeysuckles, native hibiscus, buttonbush, yellow wood. And then late summer, uh, this is when you have a lot of your tall species blooming. Late figwort is one that I didn't even know existed until I moved to our property. I had to identify it because I didn't know what it was. It's this really substantial plant with these itty bitty tiny little flowers, but pollinators go nuts for it. Uh, all types of insects and hummingbirds love it too. Giant yellow hyssop, joe pie, lobelia, native wild onions, sunflowers. There's a lot of native sunflowers to choose from. Turtle head, mountain mint. I would almost throw mountain mint on there with the other keystone species just because uh, there's so many pollinators that love mountain mint. And there's several species to choose from native thistles and jewelweed. And then fall, which is the last call for pollinators. This is the last chance for pollinators to fuel up to reproduce. And in the case of monarchs, they're migrating south. So asters, goldenrod, sneezeweed, snake root, frostweed, ironweed, and mistflower as well. And um, one of the biggest limiting factors for monarchs is actually a lack of fall, um, fall food or fall uh, nectar sources. And fun fact, the butterfly at the bottom is not a monarch, actually, that is a, a viceroy. And natives don't stop giving when they stop blooming. So in the winter time, you have the seeds and fruit that, that persist and are really important food sources for birds and rodents and other species. A lot of insects overwinter in stems and even roots of plants. And I, for me, I feel like the this, this structure provides a lot of visual interest. It's so much more interesting to look out at a bunch of different shapes and sizes of seed heads than it is just a, you know, a, a, blank, a blank canvas. And let your garden sleep in, as we say. You know, just don't rush in to clean everything up in the fall. There's a lot of good reasons for that, which I'll uh, detail here in a minute. So I love the term rewilding. And I love it because I feel like we as a society have gotten uncomfortable with wildness. We think of wild places as something that we leave our homes and we go to. We go out to go somewhere that's wild. And we forget the fact that we are we're born to be wild. We're, we're meant to live in the wild and live in it and live in nature. And, um, you know, we've got uncomfortable with things looking messy or untidy or unkempt. And this is what nature is meant to be like. And you invite this on your doorstep and you're, it's just so rewarding to see the explosion of life that manifests from this. It's important to keep in mind that nature knows best. Nature is the way she is for a reason. And you can also call it the lazy gardening approach, which I mean, I guess that's the real reason I like it because I'm a lazy gardener <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to let nature do her thing because I, you know, I, I don't, I don't care if things are neat or trim. So here's a few management practices you can keep in mind um, in your yard, leaving the leaves, for instance, there's uh, gosh, so many species that depend on leaf litter for habitat and for foraging. And these are just a few examples. But all stages of moths and butterflies, there's a surprising number of um, uh, moth and butter cater butterfly caterpillars and even, I think, adults in some cases that eat dead leaves. And I didn't even realize this until recently. There's a whole slew of uh, litter moths, actually. But all stages depend on leaf litter. Bumblebees like to overwinter under leaf litter. Fireflies, most um, larval, larval stages of fireflies, and even some adults live in leaf litter. Hatchling box turtles spend the first year or two of life actually in leaf litter. And you know, can't forget the other countless reptiles and amphibians. 
and so many more. It just goes on and on and on. And of course, leaves do help retain soil moisture. Uh, they're important for nutrient cycling. So where, where you can, and obviously it's gonna depend on your situation. You don't want leaves you know, clogging up drains and you know, in the road, but leave them where they fall or move them to somewhere where um, they're gonna be you know, out of the way of the road, but also benefiting nature. They make excellent mulch. They're really good mulch for your flower beds or trees. And if you can refrain from um, mowing or chopping or burning leaf litter, because obviously that's gonna kill all the organisms that are in there. Um, raking or vacuuming is better. Or if you just absolutely can't stand a single leaf in your yard, um, you can always uh, reach out to friends uh, like me. I would definitely take leaf litter. Uh, it's better than you know, carting them off and, and all those species in there um, perishing. Leaving the stems, um, st plant stems, especially the hollow and pithy types, which describes a lot of our perennials and shrubs, really great, a crucial overwintering habitat for a lot of our cavity nesting uh, bees and other species. Um, so where you can just do as nature does and just leave them alone. Uh, but you can, if you want to uh, trim them back, and I did this with some of my plants uh, just a few weeks ago, trimming them back, uh, your, your perennial stems back to about 24 inches or so. And uh, those, uh, those ends will make good nesting habitat for that spring and your perennials will grow up and hide that if you're worried about the way that it looks. Uh, if you just have to clean in the fall, uh, at least just move the stems to the side, you know, don't burn them or, you know, you know trash them or anything. And that's seen where people have put them in pots and tomato cages, that sort of thing. And just a, a little tip, bees don't nest in actively growing stems. They're only gonna be nesting in last year's dead stems, but there's a lot of species that, that will use those. Leaving limbs, standing dead timber, logs, we're safe. Logs and limbs, a really great habitat for cavity nesting bees and a lot of other species. Um, brush piles, if you can have a brush pile in your yard off to the side, gosh, so many species will use that. And if you want to, you can utilize logs and driftwood in, as decorations in your flower beds. You can pre-drill holes if you want to. The beetles will eventually make holes for you. And like I said, brush piles are great. And dirt. Dirt don't hurt, as they say. Dirt is actually very good for a number of species. So um, it is good to avoid heavy mulch if you can, just because that is a real barrier to a lot of these ground nesting species. Uh, at least 70% of our native bees nest underground and a lot of wasp species do as well. So it's good to kind of utilize other approaches when weeding, because uh, when you disturb the soil, you actually create a lot more weeds anyway. So it's good to kind of just let areas fill in with natives or have a, a ground cover. It's usually a better approach than just constantly pulling out weeds. Uh, and if you have patches in your yard that just don't grow a thing and they drive you crazy, if it's not an erosion hazard, uh, it's actually excellent habitat. And this time of year is a good time, especially if you have sandy soil, to look for lots of little what look like anthills all over your lawn. And if you see that, keep an eye out for these tiny little bees flying around. And those are, those are going to be one of two types of ground nesting bees. And uh, they're, they're harmless. They're not going to bother you. But the males come out first, and they just kind of hover over the ground. So there's uh, cellophane bees and uh, uh, mining bees. There's other structures you can utilize as well, stone walls. Bee houses, you wanna be careful of. The commercial ones are kind of crap. I wouldn't use those, um, but um, they do need to be managed because they, they do build up pests and disease pretty quickly. This is really kind of an unnatural setup for a lot of our solitary bees, and it makes it very easy for nest parasites to find them. So it's just important that you keep that in mind and manage it. I don't know if they still make butterfly houses, I just, I've never known the butterflies to use them. They're great for paper wasps though, which are also pollinators. And this over here, this is the root cellar at uh, Roan Mountain State Park. And I was just really struck when I was there. This mud stucco is full of holes, which is full of pollinators and all kinds of species. So that's another uh, habitat option there. Okay, so we're gonna spend the remainder time tonight uh, just briefly going through the different pollinator groups. And um, like I mentioned before, most are insects, but some ecosystems, the role is filled by birds. If you think about the desert Southwest, how important bats are to, um, especially the Sonoran Desert, and even uh, geckos in some habitats. So there's a lot of different pollinators, but primarily we'll be focused on the insects. So in Tennessee, the only real avian pollinator is the ruby-footed hummingbird, which is here primarily during the summer months. Um, there are 
strictly nectar feeders, although they will eat insects as well, it's just they're not feeding on pollen to our knowledge. So they're gonna be mostly going for flowers that provide a lot of nectar. Typically they like red or orange and, and just fun fact, if a flower is red or orange, it is typically trying to attract hummingbirds because bees can't see red. They're trying not to attract bees. Um, there's a lot of flowers that fall into this category. This is just a few. And there's a lot of species that don't even, you know, that aren't classic hummingbird plants that they enjoy. And there's one flower, a wildflower, that actually depends on hummingbirds for pollination. And that's the gray's lily, which is a, a um, an imperiled species that grows up on the, uh, on the balls. That is a hummingbird pollinated plant. Now beetles are an insect we tend to not think of as pollinators, but in fact, they're thought to be the first pollinators in the fossil record, the oldest. And they're especially important for, we consider more ancient flower designs like magnolias, spice bush, uh, water lilies. And um, there's a lot of species that are excellent pollinators. Now flies. We tend to not think of very fondly. Uh, we think they're gross, but flies are, believe it or not, second only to bees and their importance for pollination. Um, they're fast, they're fuzzy, they're efficient, um, and they're, they're really excellent pollinators. They're really interesting too. They can pollinate at lower temperatures and you have a, a lot of diversity in flies. And there's some really amazing mimics uh, in the flies as well, not just in the pollinating flies, but a lot of the predatory flies as well. Uh, some are just dead ringers almost for stinging insects, which is on purpose, by the way, that's to protect them. Um, there are some wildflowers that depend on flies for pollination. Uh, Jack in the pulpit is one. A lot of our trilliums uh, are fly pollinated. And fun fact, if a wildflower is maroon colored, it is typically trying to uh, imitate bloody flesh. And that means it is going to be trying to entice flies. Uh, pawpaws and skunk cabbage also fall into this category. So really, really great pollinators. And some of the, the hover flies are actually in the, the larval stage are really good for uh, pest control. And this in the upper right hand corner is an elephant mosquito. This is only the second one I've seen in my life. Um, they're a large iridescent mosquito and they're not blood suckers. They're actually nectar feeders. Uh, really great pollinators. And what's even cooler about them is in the larval stage, they eat blood sucking mosquitoes. So they're a really good one to have around. Butterflies, everyone loves butterflies. They're pretty. Even if you hate bugs, most people love butterflies. Active during the day, they're attracted to bright colors. In fact, they're thought to have the widest visual range of any animal, any species. Um, they're able to see everything from infrared to ultraviolet to even polarized light. They prefer flat clustered flowers. They like a place to perch. And um, th they can also reach pretty deep nectaries. So there's a couple of uh, plants here I'm gonna highlight. One is the orange fringed orchid. And this is a butterfly pollinated plant. It's bright orange. It has a deep floral nectary that the proboscis can reach down. And this little fringe at the bottom of the bloom here is actually a butterfly landing pad. So that is a butterfly pollinated plant. And then out of our native lilies, this is uh, in the, on the right here is um, Turk's cap lily, had to think of the common name, Lilium superbum. And if you, it's hard to tell on your screen probably, but there's this itty bitty little bee that's up in there, the flower sipping nectar, but look how far away that bee is from the reproductive structures of this flower. This is not a bee pollinated flower. This is meant for large swallowtails like tiger swallowtails and pipe vine swallowtails. So those are the species that pollinate those. Moths are a group we don't tend to think of that much because they're primarily nocturnal, um, but they're way more, they, they outnumber butterflies at least two to one. There's a lot more moth species. Um, not all of them feed, but some of the, the ones that do are very important pollinators. Um, there's actually quite a few that are active during the day. In fact, there's far more day active moths than there are night active butterflies. Typically they're attracted to pale flowers with a strong fragrance and they produce a lot of caterpillars. There's so many moths and those caterpillars are, are food, uh, important food source, especially for breeding birds. And one moth pollinated flower that I wanna point out here is the white fringeless orchid in the lower right hand corner. This is a species of conservation concern. But notice it is pale in color, so it really jumps out, it pops in low light, and it has a very long nectary. It's like a monkey's tail. So that correlates to uh, 
sphinx moths. And the sphinx moth will hover there and drink the nectar. And once it presses its face into this depression, that's where the plenia are. So that is another, that is a moth pollinated uh, plant. Wasps are another species we tend to not like. They, we don't, they don't really uh, you know, elicit warm, fuzzy feelings, but they're incredibly important pollinators and incredibly important uh, part of the environment, really. Now they are carnivorous. Uh, for the most part, they're uh, collecting animal protein to feed their young, but um, nectar is like their, uh, their energy drink. And they use that to fuel their, their uh, very uh, high energy lives. And uh, some of them especially are very good pollinators. I could spend the entire hour talking about wasps. They're just really cool. The majority of them are actually solitary and uh, I wouldn't say harmless, but they're not aggressive. They're not aggressive species. Usually it's the social, the social wasp that we have run-ins with. But they're really important for biological, biological control of pest species. Uh, a lot of them have a symbiosis with fungi and viruses. Um, and they do tend to, tend to prefer uh, shallow, pale, clustered flowers. Like I said, wasps are really cool. Up in the right-hand corner, this is a scoliad wasp, which is active usually in late summer. And they actually target Japanese beetle larvae. Um, so they're a really good one to have around, but they're, they're really important for helping to control a lot of, um, a lot of our, what we consider our pest insects. And then last but not least, the bees, which are considered the most important pollinators for both our plants and crops. Um, there's over 4,000 species in the U.S. and around 350, probably more in Tennessee. Really important for a lot of our crops. And, you know, even though honeybees get the credit for all, most of the crops, uh, it's actually been found that native bees are the primary pollinators for a lot of these, and in many cases, uh, more efficient pollinators, especially for those crops that are indigenous to the Americas, uh, very good pollinators of those. And they're such good pollinators because they have a pollen-driven life cycle. Uh, pollen in the bee world is baby food. It's what baby bees need to grow. So those female bees are equipped to gather and transport as much pollen as efficiently as they can. And our native bees are the only ones that can achieve buzz pollination, which is a high frequency vibration that releases the pollen. Uh, there's a number of crops and native wildflowers that have to have buzz pollination and honeybees don't know how to do that. So we gotta have our native bees for that. And they can see an ultraviolet and I already mentioned that bees can't see red. So. All right, uh, so if you don't happen to have a yard, and you still wanna plant native, you can. Uh, there's actually a number of native plants that do well in containers. And uh, it's actually been found that uh, urban habitat, um, even if you have just a lot of little pockets of habitat, uh, urban areas can support a surprising number, a surprising diversity of pollinators. And in fact, urban habitats support more pollinators than agricultural habitats do. So uh, just if you just have a balcony and a pot, then you're still making a difference. Okay, so I'll throw some resources at you now. If you're wanting to learn more, um, some of my favorite resources, bar none, the Xerces Society is probably my favorite sort of one-stop shop. Um, they have a website that has so many uh, free downloadable resources on everything related to invertebrate conservation, a lot of uh, resources on pollinators. They also have some books published and a YouTube channel, and they have so many free webinars you can watch uh, on their YouTube channel related to invertebrate conservation and pollinators. When it comes to learning about native bees, my favorite bee book is The Bees in Your Backyard, which is by Joseph uh, Wilson and Olivia Messenger Carroll. And if you can see on the wall behind me, the bee poster, that is a poster of native bees. And uh, it's only about 3% of the species found in North America. But you can find that uh, poster as well as a bumblebee poster on the Bees in Your Backyard website. And if you're on social media, media you can also follow them on social media. Um, Heather Holm is another great author when it comes to native bees. She published a book titled An Identification and Native Plant Forage Guide that I really recommend. It's a good one. Uh, the Xerces Society books, 100 Plants to Feed the Monarch, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees are good. Uh, an older book by Jan W. Midgley is all about Tennessee wildflowers. And it's one of my favorite go-tos for um, uh, planting and cultivating native wildflowers. Anything by Doug Colomy is top notch. Um, he's a very inspirational writer and speaker, and he's published three books to date, uh, which are an excellent resource. 
you want to learn more about butterflies, Rita Venable's book is great. Uh, she's got a lot of great information about Tennessee butterflies in there. And my favorite field guide for moths is the Peterson Field Guide. There's actually a Southeast and Northeast version. And the book entitled Wasps by Eric R. Eaton uh, is really interesting. It's a, it's a great introduction to just a little taste of the diversity of, of wasps. And if you're on Facebook, um, Pollinator Friendly Yards is a nice uh, Facebook page to uh, give you some inspiration on planning for pollinators. And I would encourage you to get involved as well. Get involved with your community because like I've mentioned, you know, it takes a community to restore pollinator habitat. It takes a community to fight invasive species. Um, the Xerces Society has a pollinator conservation program where you can certify your yard. If you happen to live in a municipality or um, uh, HOA maybe, um, they have signage that you can put out. There's other, other ways you can certify your habitat too. If you, you can be purposeful with something that may seem kind of unkempt to a lot of people, but most everyone, once they realize you're doing it for the sake of pollinator conservation, are usually pretty pretty open-minded about it. So there's there's some good uh, you can some good signage there you can get. Homegrown National Park is Doug Ptolemy's um, movement. You can uh, get on that map there. Of course, wild ones. I've got wild ones on there too. We have the Tennessee Native Plant Society and the Tennessee Plant Conservation Alliance, which are two ways you can get involved. Southeastern Grasslands Institute is another great organization I've already mentioned. Um, the Tennessee Invasive Plant Council is a great resource to learn about invasive plants in Tennessee, also to identify and report inv invasive plants in Tennessee. Um, and if you happen to work on a campus or uh, in a city uh, type job, there are two initiatives created by Xerces called Bee City USA and Bee Campus USA, which help to establish uh, pollinator habitat in those areas. Um, iNaturalist is a great resource. Um, it's a great way to report species uh, sightings, especially if they're visiting flowers. So uh, native bees in particular are very understudied and we um, are really just kind of scratching the surface on the species that are here. And we can't really protect anything if we don't know it's here. So it's a great way to share your findings. Um, if you want to follow me on iNaturalist, I, I can drop it in the chat here in a minute, but I'm Facilia15. Um, I, I'm pretty active on there, but um, it, it's a great uh, citizen science community platform. It's free. The Great Sunflower Project is another citizen science opportunity you can check out. The Tennessee Naturalist Program, I had to throw that in there because I, I'm a chapter coordinator for that. That's just a great general way to learn more about uh, natural history and uh, natural resources in Tennessee. And Weed Wrangle, uh, Weed Wrangle is actually coming up this weekend. Um, that's a great way to, to give back and volunteer this weekend. Most state parks are hosting a Weed Wrangle this weekend. So I definitely encourage you to jump on the bandwagon and help out with that. So I'll leave you with one final thought tonight. And uh, you know, we talked a lot about you know, doing all of this to preserve pollinators, but in the end, it's something that uh, directly benefits us as well, because you know, we're meant to live as a part of nature, not apart from it. So I hope you all have enjoyed tonight's discussion. Um, I've really enjoyed sharing with you tonight. And if there's anything that you have any questions about or want to discuss, then I will open the floor up for that. Otherwise, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Ollie. That was a, a beautiful and well-crafted well presentation. I'm sure everybody enjoyed that. And there are many comments in the, in the chat about that. Let me start off though with an apology. Apparently, my my um, um, Zoom nightmare was realized tonight, and I had distributed two different links, at uh -oh. least at least in one of my uh, uh, promotions of this. So I apologize to those people. I've been working behind the scenes, and thanks to Alicia um, Allen, our, our our membership chair, who got onto that and straightened straightened out and and led the the, the uh, participants from the other meeting over to the real meeting. It's like when I was in the university, my my standard nightmare was I'd get to the middle of, this, of the semester and realize I'd been forgetting to go to one of my classes. So <laughs> that's been replaced with the Zoom nightmare, which I've now realized. Fortunately, I never realized my university nightmare, but so I'm one out of two. But thank you again, Polly. We do have some interesting comments and questions in the chat. Uh, people are welcome to unmute themselves uh, if they have a question, but I'll just go from the top down and uh, see what we can get taken taken care of. 
And uh, thank your your tech support team. Uh, they did a great job, Holly. <laughs> My husband. <laughs> uh, question is, uh, how about bats as pollinators? And so, can you can you talk about that a little bit? Bats as pollinators. So, uh, I don't know of any bats that pollinate uh, in this region. Um, that's primarily going to be in the desert southwest. Um, so. They're very closely associated with a lot of the cacti, the nocturnal blooming cacti uh, in the, the desert southwest. But as far as I know, um, all of our bats here are strictly insectivores. Um, so if they happen to pollinate by accident, maybe they you know, grab an insect on a flower and move to another flower. Uh, but we don't have any pollinating bats here that we know of. Okay. They, did, they, they exist, but just not here, it sounds like. Right. Yeah. Um, now, next in the list, Paul had a, oh, no, that's to me, never mind. Um, there was a question about invasive plants, so I gave them the reference to tnipc.org, mm -hmm. and uh, you go to the rightmost uh, tab, and you can see the list of invasive plants there. Uh, they've been, uh, that list is constantly under revision, and um, they're working on, uh, again, they have a, um, uh, an emerging threat category, which is 10 or fewer counties, and a severe threat category, which is more than 10 counties. But they're continually trying to figure out the best way to get that message, uh, message across. Um, so where can I find, this is for Maggie, uh, where can I find a list of straight species I can consult when planting a garden, planting a garden? And so um, I think I referred her to uh, our we have a group working on that for our resource tab in Middle Tennessee. But if you go to say the Tennessee Valley chapter of Wildwoods, you can find a good resource there. And I also recommended Margie Hunter's book, the title of which I won't quite get correct, but uh, Planting with the Native Plants of Tennessee or something, you know, some permutation of, the, of those words. I got um, it. Gardening with the Native Plants of Tennessee, the Spirit of Place. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. I've memorized it now. Well, good. Yeah. Um, looking at some other comments. Yeah, Nick Douglas wanted to revisit the uh, early spring list. So I actually okay. lifted that PDF out of your oh, sure. presentation and, and uh, sent it directly to him. Yeah. But if, uh, if anybody else missed that, I can put it. Uh, uh, in the chat uh, so that everybody can see it again. Uh, this uh, is recorded. And so um, unfortunately the Lawn and Garden Show is coming up this week and that consumes my life until well next Monday. Right. But um, I will try to get the video up as, as quickly as possible and, and, and uh, distribute that information. And so Sharon Bell, um, has a question. If you want to unmute yourself, Sharon, if you're still with us, you can ask it or I can just read read your chat message as you prefer. Just go ahead and read it. And if it's not clear, I'll add to it. Okay. Okay. Seems pretty clear. Uh, let me give it a shot. A great place to establish pollinator habitat would be the highway rights of way. How can we work with the professionals who oversee the mowing for the Tennessee Department of Transportation? So that's the uh, that's that's the question, and this is you know SGI has worked on this uh, on, with with regard to power line mowings, and they've made a lot of progress uh, in that. But specifically, um, the highway rights of way are are a great are just a tremendous wasted resource. Mm -hmm. and so, to, to oh. our speaker, have you ever dealt with that? And and let me just uh, add a couple of things. I contacted the mowing contractor who mows the, the state highway that's, that, uh, that divides my farm. And I was told that I needed to get put up two signs that said, do not mow, and that they would respect that. And because they mow twice a year. So I said, they said, put your signs up twice a year, you know, a sign here and a sign there, we won't mow. And I did that after the, the spring mowing last year. And I did the signs and they ran over them for the fall mowing. And I was told that their person in the Tennessee Department of Transportation says, thou shalt mow twice a year. 
there is not a problem of sea of this is not a curve this is a long stretch of state highway and i think it has to be taken not to the contractor because the guys put in the middle it's it's something that has to be taken up with someone at the top at t dot no so any suggestions uh because it is a ditch i'm willing to die in <laughs> <laughs> where is my stupid well i, I do know i mean t dot does have a pollinator program go ahead did you have something paul yeah so uh I, the woman who used to run that her last name was bible has just retired and her replacement's name is Latanya Coates. Uh, if you go to the TDOT website, um, the Highway Beautification Office. I noticed when I was coming back from a class uh, with the, the Certification Native Plants class at uh, Tennessee Valley Wild Ones, that uh, the last time I was coming through in October, there was so much ironweed and rudbeckia in the median. I, I was nearly in tears. I thought, this is just beautiful. I and mean, on the verges, on the side of the road. I mean, I think they're making an effort, but obviously the more we can express appreciation for that effort and notice that effort and perhaps even lobby for more of that effort, uh, the better it will be. But I was just really impressed with how much from about Chattanooga up to just south of Murfreesboro, it was just straight uh, ironweed and black-eyed Susan um, and just gorgeous. And twice a year is not a horrible thing unless it's your property. Uh, and then uh, yeah, it, it, at least it's giving the seeds a chance toward the end of the year to uh, form and fall back in the ground and reseed the area. So Latanya Coates. Great, thank you, I've made a note of it. Okay. And there are some installations uh, that have been contracted out to various people at the welcome centers uh, that have pollinator gardens. I have not stopped at one to see it, but I believe Andy Sudbrock was uh, was involved in that for several years. Has anybody uh, stopped at a Tennessee Welcome Center and noticed if there's a pollinator garden? I haven't yet, actually. Okay. Yeah, I usually stop at other states' welcome centers, but uh, uh, there's a there's a very good one at the I-65 Ardmore, just north of the Alabama line, because. Uh, when the hibiscus went to seed, uh, I have to confess that we collected oh two or three seeds from the hibiscus to take with us. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> that's that's one in particular that Andy has told me about. But um, so baby steps is for sure, but at least to point it in the correct direction. Thank you for that question and comment, Sharon. Richard, can you see my comment and question? I don't know that I'm to it yet. Okay. I, I can't see any of the others other than mine, which is really odd. Oh, you got you. Well, yeah. Okay. No, it's fine. Uh, when is the right time to cut back of the stems in spring is one of the questions from Steve. And that came direct to me, so you won't see that. So the best time... I mean, I, I cut mine back um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, you don't have to cut them back at all, really. I mean, you can just leave them uh, the way nature would. Um, but some, it kind of depends on the source. Some say that it's better to wait because uh, sometimes if you cut them back, you may already have something overwintering in them. Um, most everything tends to merge once temperatures get consistently over 50 degrees. However, there are a lot of species that emerge later too. You have kind of a staggered emergence of all these different species that emerge. So if you can leave them alone, just leave them alone. <laughs> but um, you can, you know, if there's nothing already nesting in them and you trim them back, it does open it up and make it more, um, more appealing to some of the stem nesting bees, like the, the little um, small carpenter bees and species like that. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> And so once, whenever you do cut, cut them back to about two feet, uh, yeah. I just leave those at two feet because I don't think they bother anything. And uh, Heather Holm believes that uh, most of the action is in the bottom two feet mm -hmm. of the stems uh, anyway. I haven't 
I don't know that that's scientifically determined, but that's that's kind of her advice if I'm capturing her correctly. Hello, I'm Alice Jensen again. Yes. And uh, I was led in a way to see the, the cacao plant. Oh, I was going to ask you if you got that information out of the out insect of my crisis head. book by Oliver Millman. Uh, out, out of my head. Well, good for you, Alice. But because, it turns out that in the, the book called I The Insect seen, Crisis by I've Oliver Millman. Them, and I would be made to, uh, way too slow to look anything up in a book and even slower to look it up in the, uh, in the internet. But was of the books was the wildflowers of Tennessee by Dennis Horn and, uh, and Cass Kurt. And so was that book mentioned? If uh, not, if not, that is, a, is an oversight because that's to, uh, to my idea, the most uh, uh, complete book. It also uh, will tell you things like uh, if it uh, if the plant was used in voodooism or or things like that. So you can even read it as a as a as a book as literature. And if there was a picture on, I could show you my book. It uh, is uh, very well used. And uh, I claim to use uh, to uh, have a knowledge of most of the plants in there. I also have one uh, plant picture in there. And so uh, wildflowers of Tennessee and the Ohio well Valley, and it has, uh, I think, seven states. Uh, the, the plants are a mention from seven states, and that's uh, very. Uh, anyway, I'll. I I have not only studied it, but uh, and it it's it's a great book, and uh, many other regular planned books do not count with me, and uh, and in regard, if you want to study the plants and you read at the same time you have read the common name and try to get used to the scientific names because it all fits like a jigsaw puzzle uh, together. And if you start young with it, you might actually remember some at the later age. Great, it's too late for that for me, Alice, but I appreciate your comments. Um, the Paul's question was, is there an early, easily accessible article on the efficacy of bee lawns for attracting pollinator slash queen bumblebees? Yes, I don't think I have, let me see. I don't know if I have that resource on here or not. Um, I'm pretty sure Xerxes has something published for that. Um, I can follow up on that though and send that um, Send that to uh, Richard if you want, and to send on to you. Um, but there are there are some resources um, for that, and there was actually a lot of that information was actually from a webinar too that was uh, published on Xerxes, uh, looking at uh, suburban habitats and bee lawns. So, um, so there is there is, I, I can look those up if you if you want uh, direct access to those. Uh, I put the chapter uh, website in the chat and in our resources tab, we have a fairly, I would, I think a very good list of books um, that cover different, they're curated by category. And so it's an easy, easy place to find it. And, and we certainly have Dennis Horn's book uh, in that under plant ID. So. Uh. Uh, any other questions or comments? So I just wondered, I, you, you mentioned earlier zinnias and cosmos uh, at the North American butterfly. So the, the butterfly count in October uh, that many of us participated in. I was up at the Ellington Ag Center at the Wild One, uh, the uh, Master Gardeners of Middle Tennessee Monarch Way Station, certified Monarch Way Station. And I was counting and watching. 
I was surprised at how many butterflies are on the zinnias in the cosmos and how few of them were on the plants that I was sort of expecting to see them on most of the time. So I don't know if this is, you know, when, when people say I don't have much space and I say, I, I, I don't know what I can do with perennials. I'll give them some ideas of perennials, but say, if you can only put one thing, just put a bunch of zinnias out in your backyard because they seem to be very effective at drawing butterflies in and providing enough food anyway. I just, I don't know about the quality of the food that they're getting from the zinnia. Yeah, they're um, obviously yeah. really good nectar plants and it does seem to be primarily butterflies that, that like them. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's been looked at, you know, if, you know, as far as the quality of the resource. The nectar is not quite, I hate to say it's not quite as big of a deal, but the, the quality of the resource really has more to do with the, the pollen, you know, for the pollen, you know, feeding species. But um, yeah, I mean, if you had to choose an annual, I mean, I think zinnias are, are a pretty good one. And, you know, as long as they're not the pom pom zinnias. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't stay away from those things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Carol, you had a question. Do you want me to ask it or you want to unmute yourself? Um, sure, I can ask it. Go ahead. I, I was wondering about the cana lilies. I, I looked up to see if they were native, and I know they're native south of here. But the hummingbirds really like them, but they're reproducing like weeds in my yard. And I don't know, are they considered native? Should I, you know, keep them or should I just put something else there? I don't think cannas are native. Um, I don't think cannas are native. The Florida supposedly, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't. I don't know. Does anyone else know? I don't think cannas are native to Tennessee. They're not native to Tennessee. Yeah, I think so. so yeah, that might be a, a little aggressive. I know some of the lilies, and I just thought of this, there's a really cool moth that feeds on things in the lily family uh, called the Spanish moth, which, which is actually native. It's not from Spain, but um, it's the little, the caterpillars look like um, they're black and white striped, like little convicts. They're really neat, but <laughs> that doesn't really help you answer your question, but it just came to mind. Well, there, there are canis native to the Gulf Coast states from Texas to Florida. And so uh, depending on how strict you want to uh, define native, uh, that's pretty that's well within what a lot of people would be happy to have in their Tennessee yards. But technically, they're not native to uh, any county in Tennessee. Give us five years and they will be. Possibly, and humans yeah. don't. We just like the Gulf Coast. So maybe you're maybe you're a ground breaker, Carol. So. <laughs> if I could um, throw out a few questions in the light of Metro Nashville um, street tree uh, work, <laughs> and this just hit me from the recent uh, comment about lobbying with Tdot and everything. Um, one question I had is Tennessee anywhere close to having legislation to block the sale of invasive species? Um, and the second question would be, um, do we have the amount of nurseries able to support if there were any legislation similar to the street trees to require a certain percentage of natives to be planted on new developments? Well, on the um, legislation question, uh, the Department of Agriculture con controls what plants are legal and are not legal to sell in the state of Tennessee. And the statute now lists 13 plants that are illegal to offer for sale or actually sell in the state. And so I'm happy to report that bush honeysuckle and Chinese privet are both on that list. But uh, calorie pear, for example, is not on that list. And many, many uh, plants listed by the Tennessee Invasive Plant Council are still not on that list. So um, it's a sort of chapter project to find out what we have to do to get plants added to that list. And I've been um, initiating contact with someone in the Department of Agriculture to kind of get some guidance on that. Uh, what do you think, Ollie? That sounds good to me. It's not, I'm not really all that familiar with the uh, policy when it comes to, to that kind of thing. Um, I just know that it's it's going to be an uphill battle just because, you know, Warren County, Tennessee is like the nursery capital of the world. <laughs> and I know that there's a lot of that that's big money for a lot of a lot of businesses and some of some of these species. So I feel like 
Um, it's definitely, you know, we definitely need to pursue that. Um, but um, yeah, it, it is an uphill battle for sure. As far as street tree nativity requirements, that usually resides with the municipality governing. And so, for example, the city of Nashville is, is trying to inch along their tree requirements uh, for developers. There's still no legislation I'm aware of, though, that legislates single family res residences. But there are beginning to uh, have, be laws uh, on the books now that do have some restraints on what developers can do in terms of clear cutting lots. And so, but that's, that's going to vary by, um, um, by county, by city. And so I don't know of any state, uh, state rules about that sort of thing. If you go to Nashville.gov, there is a, an urban forestry recommended and prohibited tree and shrub list. Uh, so when my silver maples go, uh, people can't put silver maples back because there's uh, so many of them in the city and they're all getting old. What was that website? It is the uh, Nashville.gov and the title of the article is Urban Forestry Recommended and Prohibited Tree and Shrub List. I'll stick it in the chat. Okay, I'll thanks. And if you go to trees.nashville.gov, it'll take you there. And actually, we in Nashville cannot prohibit any trees, any certain kinds of trees being planted. We can just not recommend them. And the developer will not get approval if he puts uh, certain trees that are not recommended. But we cannot prohibit any private landowner from putting whatever they want in their yard today. And that's Patricia Miller, the recently, um, well, the former chair of the Metro Tree Advisory Committee. For those of you who don't know her. Thank you, Patricia. Sure. Um, there's a tree bill now that um, has just been pulled from the planning commission that's been worked on for two years. Just check the National Tree Conservation Corps um, organization. Um, they have worked very hard to get a, a tree bill that would protect native trees from being uh, up to 50% that developers would not be able to cut on, on their properties. Um, but it's been pulled from now um, and they are going back to the drawing board basically. Um, uh, organizations, the Home Builders Association and another uh, developers group, I think has probably given opposition to that, but it would be just phenomenal if we could get developers to leave more, you know, trees, not scrape all the life off, but we're working on it. Nashville Tree Conservation Corps, recommend going to them and supporting them. Thank you yeah, all you, so if much. You get on their, for... If you get on their mailing list, um, you'll get information regularly from them, but they are the ones um, best leading the charge to strengthen our tree bills in Nashville. Again, you know, wherever you live, you've got a different battle to fight. Mm -hmm. I really uh, appreciate everyone an everyone's answers and input. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions and comments? We're getting close to 8.30, which is our sort of cutoff time, but uh, be happy to entertain one more. Sure, she has one. Uh, just, I um, came in late, um, but how many native butterflies are there in Tennessee? The number? Uh, it's around 150. Yes, yes. I uh, just, we... Rita's book uh, only talks about butterflies that have been seen in Tennessee, so all you have to do is count the number of species in that book, and you've got a Pretty, pretty good, pretty good answer. So you say about 150 because we're yes. doing a plaque, a plaque, and we're trying to get it accurate for a pollinator garden at Nolensville High School. So what would you say about, or would you say there well, are exactly? I'm gonna, I'm gonna read what Rita wrote in her book, and I'll just send, send you that because that's, you know, there's no more authoritative source about uh, butterflies in Tennessee. But I can also check with Rita or, you know, because she's happy to, it, maybe she has an updated list and we're just waiting for the second edition of her book. But um, so let me, let me just communicate that with you after I verify the number. And Thank you. That's great, great work uh, with, the, with the garden there. Thank you. The number, 
a number of anything cannot be uh, uh, set in set in stone because like it is with, with butterflies or insects or anything that changes at any time. And, uh, yes. and uh, Rita, Rita's book is a, a best resource of any uh, butterflies. Naturally, you have to uh, forget about the moth in, in uh, pretty much in that, but uh, the pictures and everything and the resource is uh, is wonderful. Yes, yeah. The numbers, uh, you know, if you take things something like the wasps, you know, there are about one hundred and twenty thousand wasps that have been ID'd worldwide, but they really think there are around four hundred thousand or five hundred thousand, and it's because it's just hard work. Um, and so, um. We're going to have a lot more species to the, long, the longer we live up to until a point we'll have more species to uh, to identify but at some point if uh, biodiversity keeps declining at a faster and faster rate each year uh, maybe we'll have fewer to, to, to count well uh, let's thank our speaker again holly that was wonderful very nice having you with us tonight and we look forward to seeing you uh out on the trail Good to see everybody from the wormhole too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank, thanks everybody for attending. I, I appreciate it very much and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Thank you.